MSI's GTX 1080 Gaming X is one of the first 1080 AIB partner cards we received after the Founders Edition or Reference card as we are trying to revert to calling it now. So this is the Gaming X. This is the middle of MSI's stack. Above this is the Gaming Z, and then they've got some cards below it as well. Uh, so this is the middle. It is priced at $720, which puts it above the Founders Edition cards, which are $700, and above several of the other competing cards, including semi-reference cards from MSI that are priced in the $600 range. So this is pretty high up there in terms of price, but we're here to review it today, test the performance, thermals, noise, overclocking, all that stuff and see how it does. The GTX 1080 Gaming X operates at three different clock rates. Our review model shipped at a stock clock rate of 1847 megahertz, which falls under MSI's OC mode. You might need to install the MSI software to toggle these modes and see comparable results, but basically there's a step down mode, which is gaming mode at 1822 megahertz boosted, and then silent mode at 1733 megahertz boosted, which runs a lower fan speed. Now there was some discussion over the last few days about ASUS and MSI cards shipping at these highest OC settings that they have and uh, potentially having custom VBIOS for reviewers. I'm not 100% sure if that was the case here. I do know for 100% certain that uh, it did ship at that OC mode sort of preset clock rate, but that's something you could do as well. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go on a, a rant about that because there's no need to. You can basically install the, a, the, the suite for MSI's cards and then set it to OC mode and you'll have the same clock rate that we have on this thing for our tests here. So the Gaming X has an extra six pin power header and that puts it up to a total power allowance of 300 watts. If you can actually hit that with the VBIOS limitations, the voltage over voltage limitations. And in terms of VBIOS, we were told by MSI at Computex that these cards have a custom VBIOS with additional over voltage. We'll test that in the overclocking section, uh, but it should have a custom VBIOS. And then the card itself is very obviously a non-reference PCB because it's, it's quite large. So this uh, part right here, the expansion slot, is exceeded in height by the actual PCB and the cooler. And this is something that, uh, just as a brief aside, does really annoy me with these cards because they are unnecessarily tall and it's kind of annoying to work with SLI configurations or just install in some systems. It will not work in a lot of many ITX cases as a result. And the height is really just unnecessary uh, once you tear this thing apart. And I think that's maybe a way of reducing PCB thickness or something going with a higher, uh, a taller board instead. But that's one small thing here. In terms of the rest of this, uh, it does have a 10 phase power design. So the VRM's got 10 phases, significantly better than the five plus one of the reference design from NVIDIA. This is running the Twin Frozer 6 cooler from MSI, which is brand new for this generation. We talked about it in a previous video, but it's got six heat pipes. Uh, they are eight millimeters and that's most of the cooling than the rest is done through these two push fans, which push and dissipate the heat out pretty standard stuff, uh, but it does reduce thermals pretty significantly over that reference design. So for the benchmarks, we'll start with thermal performance since that's the most noteworthy with an AIB partner card. And then we'll dive into noise, FPS, overclocking, all that stuff. Keep in mind that we don't publish all our data in these videos for time reasons, but check the article linked in the description below to find all of the gaming benchmarks. So for thermals, MSI's Twin Frozer 6, as I said, has eight millimeter heat pipes, six of them that feed into the cold plate, the aluminum heat sink, has heat dissipated through the two push fans, and then those are capable of operating at zero RPM when the temperatures are below 60 C, or when the watt draw is below a certain number. MSI calls this zero frozer and is part of the silence option of the card rather than the performance option, and the feature can be disabled if you prefer to just run better thermals. The aftermarket cooler pushes the GTX 1080's thermals down to 45.3 Celsius Delta T over ambient, and that's running the higher clock rate as well. So we've already put ourselves in a good position here. The difference is a full 12 Celsius Delta T versus the reference design, which is 23.75% if you convert it to a percent difference. The idle temperature runs higher on MSI's card, but the increase is negligible and really not noticeable at all to a user, other than the fact that the fans are running at zero RPM. So it's got a couple degrees warmer idle for a much lower load temperature and for better 
silence during the low load times. This is a serious improvement over the reference design, which had a thermal wall of 82 Celsius. That's absolute, not delta. So uh, that would put you in the 60s or so for the delta metric. But 82 Celsius was the thermal wall, at which point we saw some pretty heavy throttling on the clock. And that's resolved by these aftermarket coolers, which is something we proved before these were even out by building a custom 1080 hybrid using the 980 Ti hybrid solution uh, from EVGA and then throwing it onto a 1080. So we already showed how that works and this is a, a further proof of concept where we're not hitting that endurance limiter. Here's a look at our noise testing chart where we have decibel levels of this cooler against the Founders Edition cooler and other products. But if you wanna read specific analysis on noise, check the article and we also have test methodology there for you. Now note that while doing this noise testing, we did observe some coil whine when overclocking, but it was nothing that would be troublesome if the card were installed inside of a case. In an open air bench though, it was a little bit noticeable. Frame rate on the MSI GTX 1080 Gaming X is unsurprisingly improved over the reference card, running the clock rate at its OC mode, which is the default mode our review sample is running at, produces reasonable gains over reference, but we were expecting a lower price than reference, and that's not the case. So the argument is definitely a little more difficult to make when the card is priced higher, despite being overall better. And the value is muddied past that $700 mark anyway. Let's get into FPS tests. So first of all, all the tests for FPS are in the article below, but we'll start off with GTA 5, which shows a minimal FPS gain with the MSI Gaming X flavor of the GTX 1080 when playing at 4K we're seeing a gap of two FPS or 4.02%. And at 1080p, so dropping from 4K, that translates to a 3.5% delta, which again, not very impressive, but still we're already reasonably ahead of the reference card in FPS and well ahead of it in thermals and noise in some ways. So not terribly noticeable, but not terrible either. Black Ops 3 posts the 1080 Gaming X at 211 FPS average for 1080p high settings, which is really only reasonable if you're trying to hit 200 Hertz for some reason. And that's a nine FPS gain over the FE card or 4.5%. And at 1440p, that gain is somewhat carried with 140 FPS for the Gaming X versus 135.3 for the reference card, or about a 3.4% delta. 4K has us at 71.3 FPS versus 68 FPS on the reference card, and that's a 4.7% delta. So uh, we're in the three to five range overall for Black Ops 3, and in the three to four range percentages for uh, GTA 5. Shadow of Mordor at 1440p puts us at 108 FPS with the pre-OC gain and that's a 1.87% climb over the FE card. At 4K, we're seeing a couple FPS gained that amounts to about a 4% jaunt in performance overall. And again, as with the previous ones, none of this is overall impressive, but somewhat expected for what is effectively a factory overclocked GTX 1080. The differences should shine most in thermals and noise though, and theoretically in overclocking, but we'll get to that soon. Like previous titles, Ashes of Singularity is showing more or less identical performance between the cards. The 1080p high test has the Gaming X card just barely over one FPS ahead of the FE card for DX12. That is outside of margin of error but it is pretty close to margin of error. DX11 has us within 0.5 FPS difference, not percent, FPS. At 4K high with Ashes, we see a couple FPS gained with the Gaming X, but it is again more or less inconsequential at a 6.02% delta. 4K crazy shows a bit more difference and seems to be hinging on the clock rate more heavily than the previous cards. This is because it's becoming GPU throttled. And that posts a delta of 12.6% difference between DX12 tests on the FE and the Gaming X cards. That delta is 7.12% when running DX11 instead. This thing, we had a maximum core clock resting at 2050 megahertz all totaled, and the memory clock was 5454 megahertz, and that's an effective of almost 11 gigabits per second. The power target on this card maxes out at 107%, so it's a lower power target percentage than the Founders Edition card, but the power design is much different, so it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one linear comparison in that regard. I mean, we've got an extra power header. Uh, so that is 
the limit on power. It's 107% of what this board can provide. The V core stops at 1.062 volts. And uh, that seemed to be a hard limit because when we hit the 40% offset for voltage, it was not any different than when we went 50, 60, 70%, whatever. It's all 1.062 volts. So here's a look at our chart showing the stepping for this video card and overclocking it. You can see the passes and fails of different endurance or brief initial tests uh, showing our final clock rate of 2050 megahertz. And then here's a look at our GTX 1080 reference or founder's edition results where we settled at about 2025 to 2030 megahertz, somewhere in that range. And the GN hybrid, our custom liquid solution that uses an EVGA 980 Ti hybrid cooler, but on the 1080 that we built, managed to pull off 2164 megahertz max. So uh, keep in mind that these are real tests. We could push these clock rates way higher if we just ran Fermark or something and did synthetic tests like you'll find in some places. But the problem with these synthetic tests is they often load the GPU in one way very specifically and maintain that load throughout the test. So uh, you don't have this fluctuation in the clock rate like you do with real gaming where the GPU will throttle back when it's not necessary or push harder when there's a really complex geometrically intense scene or something like that. Uh, so you don't see that with synthetic testing. That's why we use these games. Fire Strike is a good alternative for kind of live overclocking, just figuring stuff out. And these results are what, with a card similar to this one at least, given uh, variances for the, the Silicon Lottery, uh, they are representative of what you will achieve for a real gaming scenario. Basically a 2050 megahertz output, and then here's the FPS differences in the charts now. Overall, you'll see a couple percentage points difference at best from the OC mode and our manual OC, uh, and that's really about what you would expect for this type of overclock. So overclocking wasn't really that exciting. It wasn't bad. It was still a 20 to 25 megahertz increase over our Founders Edition testing, but in no way is that worth another $20. What is worth another $20, though, is the substantially improved thermal solution. This thing brings you down 12 Celsius. That puts you way below the 82 Celsius wall where there's throttling. And that's the next important point is that even though the Gaming X doesn't overclock in its core clock significantly higher than the Founders Edition, the endurance testing is much better. And this is something that uh, we just started doing recently where we'll run an endurance test to see how well a clock rate sustains over time as heat generates. Uh, so it does resolve some of that. Thermally, we saw about a 25% improvement in temperatures. Noise is reasonable. It's effectively zero dB output when running below 60 Celsius. If you have that enabled, the zero frozer technology that they've got in here, which is really just a uh, fan throttle that most of these cards have these days. And then in terms of overclocking itself, the gaming actually marginally improves over Founders Edition. This seems to be more of a limitation with Pascal than with, say, MSI. Uh, so this is really a, a thing on Pascal slash NVIDIA where there's maybe a VBIOS or voltage limitation or some other kind of wall where it's very difficult to get these things over 2100 or even at 2100 megahertz, with the exception being our hybrid where we did some special tuning. Uh, but in general, that seems to be about the limit I'm not clear yet if that's because of uh, volatility of the FinFET process or, or what's going on there, but that does appear to be about the limit on these cards. FPS 1.8% to 12% better with overclocking, depending on what game, generally about 5% average improvement for overclocking. And the card itself, ignoring overclocking, so thermals are good, we've said noise is reasonable. The price I am not a fan of, uh, I don't think that $700 is a good price for the 1080 in general, and $720 I, I really don't think is a great price. So right now, most of these cards are $1,000 on Amazon. I'm not saying this one specifically, I'm saying all GTX 1080s you can find today are $800 to $1,000, which is insane. Do not pay that amount of money for, uh, for the 1080. That's just a supply and demand thing. It will calm down. Prices will fall. They always do. So hopefully the 720 kind of drops below the reference price as things normalize, but uh, I wouldn't be a buyer at this price right now. I'd want it to at least be 700, if not slightly lower. 
Next thing, uh, this is certainly much better than the reference design. It's got a better power management setup. Oops, <laughs> better power management setup. It's got uh, two times the phases for the GPU. And although the clock rate is capped around the same, the stability is better. Now, one thing I'd really like to see MSI improve on is the height of their cards. I know they're doing this whole gamer thing, but this is just, it's just too tall. I don't know that it needs to be. Uh, maybe a thicker PCB would, would resolve some of this, but the height is an issue for many ITX builds. It's obnoxious for SLI. If you're trying to mix and match cards, which whatever you shouldn't do, but uh, I mean, people do it. Uh, and it's just unnecessary. Uh, so that is one thing I'd like to see improved, but they're not alone here. Gigabyte does the same thing and it drives me crazy. Um, but that, that's how it is. It's a very small complaint. In terms of what you should buy, I would suggest waiting right now because the market's about to flood with 1080s from all these different vendors. And uh, EVGA has got their hybrid coming out. We've heard rumor that should be 700-ish or below. Below this maybe is a possibility. If that is the case, be a very serious thing to consider. Uh, FTW is also coming from EVGA, that's air-cooled. And then Gigabyte's got the G1 Gaming, which is cheaper than this, I believe from memory. That one is in the 650 range, and then the Extreme Gaming one is in the 680 range. Uh, so those would be worth considering as well. The ASUS Strix will be cheaper than this as well. So depending on what you want, it's worth looking around, waiting for more reviews, and honestly, none of these are really available at their advertised prices right now anyway, so it doesn't do harm for you to just relax, take a few weeks, research these things, see what's going on. Now, as far as when they will be available at reasonable prices, we've heard through board partners, not MSI specifically, but through others, uh, to expect sometime in the next month that supply and demand may stabilize, and that's when you'll see the prices kind of hit where they should be. So you've got a good month to research things and figure it out, if not potentially more. But that's it. That's what I got for you. Having trouble hitting 2100 megahertz on any of these, uh, liquid notwithstanding in our special test. As always, Patreon link the post roll video if you want to help us out directly. Subscribe for more of this content, because there's a lot of it. And I'll see you all next time. <laughs>